Okay. I have uh, 12 o'clock on my dial here. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, thanks for participating in today's uh, At One presentation uh, with the ACCJC. Uh, DE on the front burner, new regulations, new challenges, and accreditation. Uh, I'm Michael Orloff, Interim Co-Director of At One. And we have a great panel today of people uh, sharing with you. Uh, that, but first, we're going to go through a few housekeeping slides just to get everyone prepped for today's session. Best thing, first of all, is obviously maximize your uh, confer window. And if you happen to be on the phone, uh, again, we could turn it into presenter-only mode, but I'm hoping that everyone uh, if you happen to dial in, uh, could just press star six if you have yet, yet to do so uh, to mute your phone uh, so that our presenters uh, can speak uh, clearly and not uh, hear any background noise. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, and I'm sure we will have some questions uh, or have comments, please use the chat window to the lower left uh, uh, and type them in there. Since we have such a large group, uh, we, we feel that we will need to use that and we'll be able to capture those questions and, and share those questions with the panel uh, when the time arrives. Adjusting audio. Um, if, you, if, you have, uh, if you're listening in on the computer, you'll notice in the lower left-hand corner of the confer window is a uh, handle with a speaker. And all you need to do is slide that to the right uh, to a comfortable listening level. If you happen to be listening over the phone, down in the lower left, uh, right corner of that audio panel, there's a little telephone handset. Just press that. That tells the computer that you're using the phone and no need to uh, send it through the computer speakers. And most importantly, uh, you don't want to listen on both the computer and the phone at the same time because that's where you get that echo. So we can say we're going to have a lot of information today. So you can save files using the uh, floppy disk icon. What is that? Uh, up in the tool uh, bar, um, and that will save your files to either the whiteboard format or PDF. And also, if you uh, would like captions, you can click the CC button in the tool bar above, and that will launch a, a small window uh, in the lower left-hand corner with your captions available. Emoticons and polling. Basically, obviously, with a larger group, um, if you wanted to use uh, the tools for sharing a certain emotion or whatnot, you can see that there's smiley faces, confusion faces, uh, applause, disapproval. You can use those to um, share information. We can also be pull there might be polls, uh, which uh, are a green check or a red X. Usually, the green check is is yes, and the red X is a no. Uh, if uh, if there happens to be a poll provided by the panel. And you can use those buttons in the participants window in the upper left corner. There was a question, uh, will there be a recording available after the event of this? And the answer to that is yes. We will be recording this event, which I'm going to start in a couple minutes here. Um, and it will be provided to you and sent to your email, um, a link to the archive, uh, 48 hours after the end of this presentation, uh, as long as you registered uh, within the time frame. So the next, step, the next step is I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask whoever is still on to press star 6 to mute. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and start the recording. Uh, just open it up one last time, and then I'm going to uh, hand it over to Pat James, who's going to be your MC for today. So let me start that recording. Oh, actually, somebody already started for us. <laughs> Great. So uh, again, this is the DE on the front burner, new regulations, new challenges, and accreditation uh, webinar. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it right over to Pat James, our MC for today. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a little nervous. This is quite a large group. And if, I, if you were on campus right now, I'd probably be on stage doing a little dance for you, but I can't. So. Um, in your mind, you can see me doing a little tap dance and kind of going, okay, that's just to relax myself a little bit. Um, I'm real excited about this because I think it's going to start something new and, and um, new for us with our accrediting agency and give us more connection to those folks who are trying to help us be the best we can be. Um, today's seminar is 
brought to you in conjunction with At One. So it's between At One and the ACCJC in partnership. It's a really great partnership that I hope will continue. Most of you know me. I'm the Dean of uh, Distance Learning and Library and Technology at Mount Santa Center College. And I work a lot with the DE coordinators in the state of California. And there are a lot of you on, I can see, which is really exciting. Um, I want to introduce the presenters very quickly. The, of course, Barbara Bino, who is the president of the Accrediting Commission for the Community and Junior Colleges. Um, Cheryl Thompson, who is at American College of Education. And she'll give her credentials when she starts speaking. Um, James Glapagrosclark, who is the dean, um, also of the same kind of position that I have. He does distance education at College of the Canyons. And many of you know him. Um, Susan Clifford, Vice President of the Commission Operations at the ACCJC. Jack Pond, who is Vice President of Team Operations and Communications at ACCJC. Krista Johns, Vice uh, President for Policy and Research at the ACCJC. And I want to particularly thank Krista for all of her work in helping me set this up. Between the two of us, we were able to get it pulled together. And, and that's just the components of the slides and all that. Um, and we hope it all goes smoothly. We're both saying little prayers right now, I think. Um, and our moderator, particularly, Micah Orloff, who's the new uh, director of At One. And I really want to thank him for all his energy and work in putting this together as well. So I'm going to um, turn this over to Barbara. And we have a lot going on in distance ed uh, in our regulations and the things that the federal government's requiring of us. And that and we were hoping to demystify what the ACCJC would be looking for when they come um, to do our accreditation visits and particularly look at our DE programs. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Barbara, who will introduce the webinar a little more. OK, thank you, Pat. Um, I'd like to just start by uh, letting you know I'm the president of the ACCJC, the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges of the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. And I want to welcome all of our online guests from our member institutions. I'm really pleased to uh, be a participant this today in our first webinar. And so um, we're, we're, as Pat mentioned, we're hoping it goes well. Um, we also extend our sincere thanks to Pat James and to Mika Orloff uh, as, um, as for helping us set this uh, up. The webinar is going to be stored at uh, CCC Confer, or at At One, I think is its new name. But we'll also put a link to it on our commission web page in the next uh, week, so you'll be able to get in through there. Next slide. Oh, purposes of the seminar. Stay here, Micah. Um, you can see three purposes there to provide you with some information uh, and let you know what accreditors are doing and also help you um, achieve quality standards. The Department of Education has adopted new regulations that impact institutions that provide distance education and that impact accreditors that review institutional quality for such institutions. The regulations are multiple. They occur in multiple sections of the law and of the regulatory source documents. And they're complex. So we have several experts here today to help us all better understand the new requirements. I think if you went looking to find these portions of the law yourselves, you'd, you'd have to look in many places within the federal regulation. So we're hoping to cover the key pieces of, inform of, need, uh, of information to you today. Next slide, please. Hey, Barbara. Um, any chance you can uh, project just a bit more? People are uh, saying that they can. You're, you're very soft, like you, they can barely hear you. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm going through a um, a phone in a hotel room. Is this any better for folks? Better. Okay. I will do that. Um, First, some introductory facts. Um, certainly, there's been a national and federal increase uh, in the growth of distance education. And um, there have been significant increases in the number of institutions offering distance education. There's been a huge increase in the number of programs that are offered solely via distance education. And then a significant enrollment in student, stu of students in distance education. The 2008 federal regulations reduced limits on federal aid for students enrolled in distance education. And that is part of what has fueled an explosion or a huge increase in distance education enrollments. Uh, and some of those enrollments have occurred at private for-profit institutions. And as we'll see as we go through this workshop, um, uh, that particular uh, area of growth has given rise to other kinds of concerns that have, have come over into distance education. Um, there are associated uh, issues or concerns about quality in distance education at the federal level. 
Uh, and one of them is covered clearly in uh, the federal regulations, and that is authentication of the student who is enrolled in distance education. We'll cover that today. Uh, there are also many new pieces in the regulatory language about accreditation and how accreditors have to assure quality and conduct certain kinds of reviews during our comprehensive evaluation studies. Uh, and just recently, there's an emergent um, uh, set of stories about emergent financial aid fraud rings that are using distance education and, in particular, community colleges um, uh, to perpetuate fraud and, fraud and distance education. So these are all things that have increased federal and national interest. Next slide. Um, certainly, next slide. Let's see. Sorry, sorry, Barbara. Um, you know what we're going to go ahead and do is we're still hearing some background noise, so I am going to put it on presenter only mode, and then I'm going to ask you since you, uh, I think, um, dialed in with the other code to just press star six to unmute after I'm done. Okay. Unmute. Okay. In my time, still, can you hear me? I can hear you. This is Cheryl. Yes, we can hear you now. I'm still on. All right. Uh, certainly at the national level, there's a recognition of the benefits of distance education. And you can see some of the benefits, just some of the benefits there on the screen. Um, certainly as national policy has shifted to focus to completion, Distance education is an important adjunct that will better enable community colleges to achieve President Obama's goal to produce an additional 5 million college graduates by 2020 and to ensure that the United States has the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. Next slide. But there are deep concerns about distance education that have arisen in the last few years. And perhaps the story of um, Mount St. All guests college. have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Okay, Barbara, so all you need to do is press star six to speak again. I am still here. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, perhaps the story of Mount St. Clair College, a small women's college founded in 1918 in the Midwest and transformed in 2005 to a distance education institution named Ashford University that now has more than 80,000 students is the case that drove the concerns about distance education to the national stage. Senator Harkin's Health Education Pensions and Labor Committee, or the HELP Committee, held hearings in the summer of 2010 examining the quality of uh, education at uh, Ashford University. And I think many of you will have read the newspaper stories, if not uh, the actual financial aid audit about that institution. A uh, Department of Education audit had followed a review by the regional accreditor, the Higher Learning Commission of the North Central Region, and both reviews found significant issues with financial aid and academic integrity. Senator Harkin's case and his discussion of the case repeatedly um, drove the uh, uh, news about the case uh, to the headlines of national newspapers. Uh, and there continue to be cases of fraud and abuse that keep these same concerns al alive. Unfortunately, what's happened for those of us who believe distance education is a really important and um, legitimate form of education, that concerns about fraud have spilled over generally into distance education institutions. So we're undergoing a new degree of scrutiny uh, as, um, as this concern about fraud and abuse uh, has extended outward. Next slide, please. The ACCJC has some concerns about distance education, and I thought I'd share them here briefly, although our, uh, our presentation today will cover some of them in more detail. First of all, there's been a tremendous growth in enrollments in distance education. 129 of the 134 member institutions that we uh, accredit now offer distance education. So it's ubiquitous. Some of the smaller WASC accredited uh, colleges in our region are using distance education enrollments to provide up to half of their total enrollments um, at the institution. And smaller institutions see distance education as an opportunity for growth that their local community may not provide. The commission is concerned about quality. Data show that growth is occurring rapidly, sometimes in excess of an institution's capacity to provide adequate technological services and support services. What were once homegrown courses in institutions are needing to migrate to institutional learning management systems. And those are expensive and take time to fully install. The data institutions show the ACCJC indicate that student completion is generally lower in distance education courses than in face-to-face -face courses. And this is an issue that is replicated across the country. So assuring and improving quality is a concern for ACCJC. 
There's one other area of concern, and that is substantive change. The Department of Education requires institutions to seek substantive change approval from their accreditor when 50% or more of the courses in the program can be taken through distance education. The Commission's review is expected to assure quality of these programs, and yet we know many of the institutions we accredit pass this 50% threshold without noticing it, and they fail to get substantive change approval. That failure has consequences for their financial aid eligibility, and all participants should know that the Department regularly calls the Commission to find out whether we have approved distance education programs when they conduct institutional audits. Next slide. So here's what we hope you'll gain from the webinar. Some detailed information about the new federal regulations and your responsibilities in the institutions. And some detailed information about what the commission will be expecting as you undergo a, co a comprehensive evaluation review. We're going to share some interesting examples of the issues in distance education writ large, and then we'll have a chance for questions and answers. And I see. Barbara, you made a statement uh, about success in distance ed classes, and uh, yeah. a couple people are saying if you can repeat that. Do you yeah. have to have your computer speakers on by any chance, Barbara? No. Whoa, speakers on. I don't know. I'm turning my sound off, but I can't tell you about speakers. Okay. No, that sounds great. Um, okay. And, what and institutions tell us to answer that question uh, is institutions tell us when they provide data for us that uh, the uh, course completion rates are lower for distance education classes than they are for face-to-face -face classes. And that is a, an issue that is replicated across the country. Okay, I think with that we're ready to talk about state authorization. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, if you could mute yourself, let's see if that changes that status. It isn't. Okay. Well, we'll try to go through, and hopefully, we'll figure out what the static being caused from. If everyone would mute that is presenting. Okay, if we could go to the next op uh, the next slide after state authorization. Okay, hang on just a second. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes? Okay. All right, I'd like to introduce then uh, Carol Thompson. Boy, it's really echoing now. Um, I hope it's not me. It shouldn't be. Um, Anyway, I'm going to let Cheryl go ahead. Cheryl? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Well, I uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. I could say afternoon, but it's not afternoon for everybody, I don't think. So I want to first mention that uh, Dr. Pam Shea was unable to join us today at the last minute. So. Uh, I'm going to uh, carry the load here, hopefully, for both of us. Um, as noted on the slide here, Pam is the Vice President for Accreditation and Institutional Effectiveness at Franklin University in Ohio, which is a nonprofit private institution. It's online and also has some on-site academic offerings. They have students in 48 to 50 states at any point in time. I am the v Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Compliance at the American College of Education in Indianapolis. Uh, ACE is a for-profit online institution. We have students in many states at any given time. Uh, if any of you were on other webinars uh, that I have participated in, uh, I formerly was at Capella University for 11 years in uh, state regulatory affairs. The purpose of our presentation today was is that um, we want to sh share our combined years of experience in managing state authorizations.
for the two different types of institutions. And without Pam, there won't be quite the back and forth that we generally have with this presentation. But uh, we want to share best practices uh, of the management of state authorization processes and provide insight and experience on approaches to successfully navigate the state authorization environment. The uh, federal rules about state authorization says if an institution is offering post-secondary education through distance education or correspondence education to students in a state in which it is not physically located or in which it is otherwise subject to state jurisdiction as determined by the state, the institution must meet any state requirement for it to be legally offering post-secondary distance or correspondence education in that state. This is Barb. I'm just going to interject uh, two slides here. Um, I'm sorry, Barb. I wondered where yep. <laughs> this wasn't. Go ahead. OK. Um, while the um, uh, accreditors first thought the requirement of state authorization would uh, be an issue to be addressed by the institution and the Department of Education alone, we learned differently because federal regulations require accreditors to look at student complaint records and processes when we undertake a comprehensive review. And then also the new regulations regarding state authorization require institutions to make available to students the names and uh, contact information for all governmental bodies that approve or license the institution. And therefore, um, during accreditation reviews, the commission team look at uh, an institution's list of their state authorities and the contact information provided to students on how to file a complaint with the appropriate state. Uh, next slide. So you'll see on this slide the evidence that the ACCJ will see will require in comprehensive reviews. However, the federal deadline for this has been extended to July 1, 2014. So we have not yet sent teams out to check on this. We ha can't tell you on how well teams are doing or how well colleges are doing at, at providing this information. OK, go ahead. A quick question uh, by Frank uh, before we forward it, if possible. Uh, are trust territories exempted since they're not a state, for example, Guam? No, trust territories are not exempt, but they do have authority from their governments. Uh, in fact, your authority is in the constitution of your um, trust territory. And so you will need to have your government identify uh, an office where students can file complaints with the state authority. So to give a little bit of background, and Barbara has already touched on this, um, what has brought the whole issue of state authorization uh, from being kind of uh, unknown to being very much better known is that the federal government published new regulations which exposed existing requirements for state authorization. So the new regulations from the federal government did not create anything new as far as state regulations were concerned. However, institutions then, many were unaware that they are and had been regulated all along. States then became aware of many institutions that were operating in their jurisdiction that they didn't know about before. And as a result, a lot of confusion and a degree of panic ensued on the part of institutions. Um, I'm just going to touch briefly on the recent activity where the district court vacated portions of the regulations and there was an appeal. Um, that vacating was only on process and it has nothing to do with the fact that the state regulations are still in place, have been in place, and the federal regulation does not negate what state regulations have been all along. And that's been a major source of confusion, I think, on a number of uh, fronts. When it comes to authorization, another uh, misnomer can be that um, institutions 
think that it only pertains to um, having distance educators residing in the state. And that is not the case. It does apply to distance education, but there are a number of triggers uh, that make it necessary for institutions to get authorized to operate in, in states. One can be students residing in a state, distance education students residing in a state. There aren't a lot of states that have that, but there are a few. Other states may have uh, the regulation that if you have any faculty who reside in a state, even if they're teaching students online, but if they reside in a state, that can be a trigger for physical presence, which requires state authorization. Recruiting and advertising is very common. Um, and of course, there are different definitions of what that means in any state. But that's a common trigger, so that if you're recruiting or advertising in a particular state, that could require you to have authorization to operate there. Sometimes, although it's not common, uh, testing sites can be a trigger. One that is becoming more and more common are internships, practica, or clinicals. So even if you have a student who is taking courses at a distance, uh, but if they are required to do an internship, a supervised internship in a uh, wherever they live, that state may have that internship activity as a trigger for needing authorization. Uh, branch campuses are always a trigger. Uh, so that just gives you, this isn't an all-inclusive list, but it gives you some of the more uh, common ones. Errol, so, yes. Sir, I'm going to interrupt you for just a minute. I need all the moderators to please mute themselves except for Carol. So star six on your phone. And if you're not muting yourself that way, please turn your speakers off. OK, give it a try. OK. So we're going to um, talk a little bit about, provide some guidance for how do you navigate the process upon which um, everything should be founded. There are multiple sources available now as far as having the links to the regulation. On, I'm sorry. Cheryl, hold on just a second. OK, I think you're good to go. OK. So the first thing you want to do is start with the official regulations. There are multiple sources that are available now that will provide links to those regulations, um, WCET, uh, SHEO, um, there's an, I know at least one law firm that has a service for a fee where you can get uh, quarterly updates on uh, regulations and any changes in regulations. However, it's also important to know that the regulations are not always clear and they are subject to interpretation. And they do not always make sense. Uh, one of the continual challenges being in the regulatory world is um, to get people to understand that, no, it doesn't make sense, but this is what it says. Or it doesn't make common sense, but this is what it says. If, where, or how to seek authorization, it all depends on several factors. It depends on the kind of institution you are. It depends on the delivery format. And it depends on the types of activities conducted within the state's borders. What I earlier called triggers. So in the case of, uh, you know, in some states, and I'll get into this a little bit later, in some states there's an actual formal exemption allowed if you represent an institution that is uh, state funded. Um, or religious or, uh, institutions sometimes are exempted. But you'll want to look at, you know what kind of institution you are, and then go and look at the regulations 
and figure out where you stand in the regulations. Based on the regulations, you'll want to start creating your own table with all the states and what the various triggers are, and then whether or not you actually participate in one of those triggers. It's important, though, to, to know where your students are, because that's going to be one factor to consider. When you get to the uh, regulations, I recommend strongly that you first start with the definitions, because every state has its own terminology. And then you will want to adjust your institution's terminology to match what's in the state regulations. For example, I've used some here in the blue uh, bubbles. Physical presence. In one state, it will mean one thing. In another state, it'll mean another. The same with to operate. Some states actually define it. Other states do not have a definition. Educational services is a perfect example. In some states, educational services will spell out very clearly that it could be things like advising or um, a recruiting office or so forth. But it might mean something else in your institution. An agent. Even the basic definition of what is a higher education institution, there will be different kinds. In some states, there will be different definitions for different kinds of institutions. And you'll want to find where does your institution fit within these definitions. And as I mentioned earlier, the next part to go to is look if there are any provisions for exemption. And does your institution fall within that uh, provision? Doing the process of state authorization work takes a whole team of people. And so we have uh, just laid out here a guideline to use as to how to put this together. Um, what I have found works best, and I know Pam does this the same way, is to have one person who is an overall manager of the process. Um, and they then would gather a team of people together who have expertise in various areas across the institution to uh, populate the various elements within the application itself. You want somebody who is very detail-oriented and a multitasker with some pro strong project management skills and administrative skills. You want somebody, this is the manager person now, you want somebody with a strong understanding of the entire institution because these applications will include anything from an audited financial statement to enrollment information to a description of the library to um, telling the state on which page of your enrollment agreement this particular requirement is found, the catalog, all kinds of things. Um, it's best if you have someone who's connected with people across the institution and someone who's able to condense large volumes of information into usable documents and sections uh, that need to go into the various applications. Every state has its own form of application. Some states, the applications are more freeform, where it'll just give you almost like an accreditation report, where you um, provide you know, paragraphs of responses. Other applications will be you have specific uh, amount of information that you could fit within a certain piece of their table and so forth. You need somebody with a strategic perspective, somebody who um, can help facilitate decision making in gray areas. Because uh, although you'd like to think that regulations are black and white, they might be on a piece of paper, but they aren't when it comes to operationalizing them. And this manager person also would need to be one who could participate in risk analysis, because there is that involved as well. What level of risk will your institution be willing to assume as they look at all of the information before them regarding where they would need uh, or want to get authorized to operate? It's important to build internal relationships, um, because as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, these applications will require information from all areas of the institution. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. I'm not going to read it to you, but you can see for yourself. These are just, these are just nine. Um, but 
it, it can be a uh, rather significant project. You also want to build external relationships, and this is really key. You want to develop relationships with the state regulators. They're not bad people. The vast majority of them want to help. They um, understand that uh, to have the more educated residents they can have, the better it is for their state. So they are not the enemy. But two things you should know is that one is they are their job is to enforce regulations that they weren't responsible for for putting into place. They're responsible for adhering to them and enforcing them, but they didn't necessarily create them. The second is, especially since the state authorization uh, matter has come to the forefront in the last year and a half to two years, they are absolutely swamped with work, and many of them have had hours reduced, and they've had to reduce staffs because uh, of the cuts in state budgets. So as you're building this relationship with the state regulators, um, First, again, you review the regulations and the requirements, and then you approach them with questions. It's not wise to approach them and say, please tell me how to do this. You're better off to have read it for yourself, and then you can ask specific questions. How does this apply to our situation here? Uh, some things will be clear, and some things will not. But the state regulators will appreciate the fact that you've done some of the homework yourself, so you're talking from a perspective of educate, having already known something, and you're not, they're not having to read the regulations to you. And uh, one more thing about understanding the regulators is that their perspective is consumer protection and enforcement of regulation. Cheryl, are the, can you describe who the regulators would be again very quickly? Yes, the regulators I'm talking about now would generally, again, it's different by state, but generally it's somebody in a higher education commission function. Uh, although some states, the regulator actually is the state uh, university system. Mm -hmm. um, I can give a couple of examples. Here in Indiana, it's um, What's the acronym is ICOL. I just moved to Indiana, so bear with me here. Indiana Commission on Proprietary Education. Uh, in Minnesota, it's the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. In Wisconsin, it's the Educational Approval Board. Uh, but it's generally uh, an entity like that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Another way to build the external relationships is to attend the regulatory meetings and conferences. Um, they, they, there can be ones that are federal, state, and also there are individual state agency um, conferences. Volunteer to serve on state or national task forces. Uh, rep represent your institution at meetings and conferences. And then network across agencies and institutions. Pam and I, Pam O'Shea, um, she and I have over time built a great friendship because we do the same kind of work. We're from very different kinds of institutions, but we've helped each other and we can bounce ideas off of each other as well as keep each other informed if we hear that something might be changing in a state or whatever. Uh, that's an informal way of keeping abreast of some of those things. Part of your decision in whether or not you're going to seek authorization to operate in the state is the cost and uh, benefit analysis. Some of, that, some of the factors in that analysis are how many students do you have in the state, what activity does your institution want or need to conduct within that state, how much does it cost for the initial approval to get the renewals to pay for bonds, what is the cost of not serving existing students, what's the cost of monitoring and maintaining the authorizations. All of these data points are are important and it, there are strategic decisions that need to be made. I have heard several times over the last couple of years, well, are you telling me then that our institution may not be able to serve students in the state? And the answer to that is yes, maybe, but that's what your individual institution will have to determine. Especially let's take, for instance, again, I'll pick on Minnesota. Minnesota is a state where if you have, if you have students in Minnesota, and you are offering distance education to them, 
that creates physical presence in Minnesota. So you would need to be registered with the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. So if you know that, then from there you would have to do your cost-benefit analysis. How much would it cost in time and money to get that approval in Minnesota? What does it cost to renew? And all of those things. It may be worthwhile for you and it may not. Um, but that's just an example of what I've been talking about. Just a question, Cheryl. Uh, yes. You can answer anyone on the panel for that matter. Um, by Diane, for multi-college districts, is state authorization done for the district or by college? It's usually by college. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Once you have authorization to operate in a state, it doesn't stop there. There's ongoing maintenance. Um, generally, you have to get reauthorized, and in most states, it'll be an annual. Uh, whenever, once you have gotten an authorization to operate, what you've done then is put yourself under the jurisdiction of that state, which means if you're going to add any new programs, they have to approve that. Um, there sometimes can also be an additional annual reporting of uh, revenue or enrollments. Sometimes uh, if a state has a surety bond in the initial approval, they would require you to renew that bond for the renewal application. Some states, if you're sending recruiters into the state, on the ground into the state, they require that those individuals be licensed as agents. And various states have various processes and costs uh, attached to that as well. Even for exemptions, in some states, uh, an institution can get an exemption, a formal exemption, um, but in some states it costs some money. In some states you still may have to report enrollment, and in some states you have to renew even the exemption. Uh, that process though is usually much, much uh, less onerous than some of the other uh, when you have to go for full uh, authorization. So what you would want to do is develop a system for a regular review of your processes, your information. Uh, I suggest you keep a record of some collateral material. For instance, many states will say, what are your library resources? Keep that information someplace so that you can just you know, copy and paste it into the next state application. However, you know, on a regular basis, you'd want to make sure that whatever that information is, is the most up to date. Um, so that's, that's state authorization at uh, 101 at a very basic level. I'm, I'd be happy to field any questions at this point if you have any. Mike, do you want to go ahead with that? Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of different chatter going on and, and some of them I can't tell if they're chatter to others or if they're directed at the uh, panel. So if you do have a specific question for Cheryl, if you wouldn't mind uh, typing in uh, that question, that'd be great because a lot of it seems like chatter above. I see one here that the last comment here on the chat is from Jim. And I just want to again reiterate that there are very few states where having students in the state triggers physical presence. There are a few. So that is not true in all 50 states. And there's been a lot of confusion even with the federal regulation. Some seem to think that that meant you had to have state authorization in every state where you have students. That is not what it says. What it says is you have to have state authorization in any state that says you need state authorization in that state. So then that goes back to what do those in, that individual state regulations say. And um, there are very few that having distance ed students reside there is a trigger. Uh, um, Cheryl, Pam, uh, Frank is asking, um, is there a URL available that lists who and where the state regulation, regulators are for specific areas? And I think WCET is putting that together, correct? WCET has that, yes. So if you go to their website and um, they have um, information with all the URLs, including, the nice part is, it even has links to the regulations themselves, not just the agency, but the, ag but the regulations themselves. I want to caution you, though, that all of that information is a point in time. Mm -hmm. And state regulations are changing all the time. 
So it's a good place to start. It's an excellent place to start. But you can't depend that because that was created at a point in time, you still would want to go to the state website and look for to make sure that the uh, that you're looking at the most recent regulation. There is also another caveat to that. Some states have regulations and some have policies around the regulation. So just uh, keep that in mind. Uh, some states have been really good in revising their websites so that right on the front page it'll tell you uh, about state authorization and the things to look for. Uh, more and more states have done that, which has made it a lot easier. When I first started doing this work, it was like trying to find a needle in the haystack. So, some other questions there, Cheryl. Uh, Larry uh, has one. Would some regs uh, address the breadth and depth of student and faculty assistance? Most DE programs have only small staff. Would you repeat that question? Would some of the regulations address the breadth and depth of student and faculty assistance? Most DE programs only have small staff to support it. Not, no, not the breadth and the depth. It either is or it isn't. Okay. Pam has a question. What are the average fees for state authorization? There is no average. <laughs> <laughs> there is no average. It depends on the kind of institution you are and which state. Some states it doesn't cost anything. Some states it's just astronomical. It also, depends, it also depends on how big your institution is. Right. There are a couple of states you're not doing business in, correct? Correct. Which ones? Do you mind? <laughs> um, well, Tennessee is one. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, uh, yeah. You want me to go forward, Pat, with questions? Yeah, go ahead. Me? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Doug uh, asks, uh, this is actually about uh, the CCC Chancellor's Office managing centralized approvals or putting out a grant to a college manages. Oh, is that a question? A huge burden that will be repeated up to 112 times. Um, let's see here. ABC. That's a factual statement. <laughs> oh, statement. Okay, you had a question in the front. I thought it was a question. Sorry. Um, uh, ABC. Is there a database of states with requirements? No. Okay. Uh, but. Again, if you go back to the W, like the WCET information, that will give you a place to start. And Jack posted that there at the president's desk of the ACCJC website, there is also a listing. And um, I'm I'm posting a, a I will send out to you a list of resources towards the end of this uh, webinar. With it's a PDF with a, quite a few links to it, so you'll get that. I see there's a question here from Terry. What if a distance ed student in a class moves to another state during the class term and doesn't inform your institution? Well, the fact of that is that you know even the information you provide to the state regulator, it too is a point in time. And so it's whatever exists at that point in time. When you do the renewal, then you'll have to look again and see where your students are and report your enrollment accordingly. The state is not going to chase you down if one student moves. They would have no way to know if somebody moved from one state to another during the class term. There was another question early on about international students, and I think I answered it, but you'll have to make sure that I'm correct, and that is it's up to the country. And generally, we don't have anywhere to find out that information. I think if students are coming to us um, from outside of the country, um, you know, if we want to, we want to make sure that you know, we we know what the, that country requires, but generally, I don't see as uh, this is not the same that, as what we do with international students. That's so, correct. Yeah. Okay. We're talking we're talking strictly about. I'm sure there may be things international. Pam would be able to tell you that better than me. I'm not familiar with it, um, but the the focus of this I, is was all about the states and territories, U.S. territories. Another question here um, from Carrie. If we serve non-resident students in our regular classrooms, is that considered a trigger? Non-resident is defined as out of state. No. no, in that case, we're talking about distance ed students doing their coursework in their homes where, where they live. And um, 
Jack wants us to remember that the emphasis on students who may be receiving federal financial aid for taking distance education classes. That's from the ACCJC perspective. Um, Andrea. Uh, this, uh, excuse me, but this state authorization has nothing to do with Title right. IV. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, Andrea and I, Andrea's at, at uh, San Diego, and I have been, you know, we've checked our rosters to see who's coming in from out of state. And what we've done is we've looked for students who are in our online programs but are not residents of California. So, and not just, and they're fully online. They're in our fully online program and they are not here. And that's what we're looking for. We're not that's looking correct. for students who are taking online classes and are also taking face-to-face -face classes here because they're located here. That's so that's, correct. That's, that's another distinction that you need to think about. I hope that makes sense to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then this is James and Pat. We, we've done the same thing in College of the Canyons, and we also cross-referenced student athletes who are on team rosters. A lot of our student athletes come from out of state and have out-of-state residencies, but if they're playing on a team here, we know they are physically present here, and they might be taking an online class uh, for flexibility of their schedules. But if they're playing the sport here, we know they're here. Okay. Uh, All right. More questions, Pat, or do you want to move I think forward? That's it. I think we need to move on, but I just okay. want to say that um, we will be we are going to be saving the uh, archiving the chat window here, and so we'll try to get back to you all with answers to some of these questions that we didn't get to. So if we don't get to your question, we'll try to get back to you with the answer to that question. And we're going to move on, and we're moving on now. Excuse me, can I just make one one comment? I see there's a statement here from somebody who says if one runs a DE program where students do not receive federal financial aid, this is a non-issue. That actually is not the case. It has nothing to do with financial aid. It's whatever state regulations say. But but that's one of the things that the ACCJC is concerned with. So just so you know. Uh, Okay, we're going to move on, and um, we're going to talk about student authentication. And so, Micah, you can move the slides off for this one, I believe. And um, uh, we have with us James Glapa Grosspike, who's from College of the Canyons, and he's uh, been researching this for us, and has also done a little work with our DE coordinators in this area. And so, I'd like to turn it over to James and thank him for being part of this today. Hey Pat, hey everybody, thank you so much. And all I can say is, wow, it seems like I've got an easy piece to cover. It's just something that requires <laughs> you. It only requires you to play nicely with everybody else on your campus. You don't have to play nicely with people in other states. So uh, that's really good. And also I get to be followed by uh, Jack Pond from the ACCJC who might have some more concrete answers. So uh, I appreciate having an easy bit here. Um, as, as Pat said, I'm James Scott Grossklag with College of the Canyons. Um, and I want to say thank you uh, to Pat and Micah from At One for organizing this, and a big thank you to the ACCJC for such rich, rich collaboration. Um, and we're going to go back one slide here, Micah. Go to go back one second here, and uh, you've had time to look at this uh, cartoon from the New Yorker back from 1993. Uh, I wonder if anybody remembers this uh, from the old days. Some of the early adopters might remember that once upon a time. Uh, one of the great promises of the Internet was that you could be anonymous, right? Uh, back in the early days as a teacher, or you know, an online teacher, we used to say to ourselves, gosh, you know, the students, they can be completely anonymous online and their ideas can speak for themselves. That's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, things evolve over time and that's no longer the case and we now have to um, uh, address this topic of student authentication or verification of identity as it's, as it's been called. Um, and this has been out here for a couple of years. I want to provide you with a little bit of background and a couple of couple of ways in which institutions are dealing with this and addressing it. And then uh, again, we're going to be fortunate enough to hear from uh, uh, Jack Hodge, Vice President with the Commission, uh, who can tell us in detail uh, what the Commission is going to be looking for. James, before you start, uh, a couple of people just jump back into the conference uh, on the phone. If you wouldn't mind, press uh, star six to mute. We're starting to hear that echo again. We just recently uh, jumped in via the phone. Thank you. Yeah, uh, James, did you go from a headset to hands free? Hello, is that better? Nope. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't think it was me. Sounds as though someone has a computer speaker on.
Yeah, you sounded okay in the beginning, and now. Thank you. Go ahead, James. Okay. Yeah, I think that echo's gone. Whatever happened, uh, keep it. Keep that on. All right. So, some of the background on this uh, on, on authentication, student authentication, uh, is is it, this, this originated uh, in in law and originated in 2008 with the Higher Education Opportunity Act, which is is a gift that keeps on giving for those of us involved in in distance education. Uh, that was an update of the Higher Education Act. That's the omnibus federal uh, federal bill um, on on higher education. And uh, once uh, federal legislation is passed, a, a process called negotiated rulemaking takes place, in which the uh, representatives of the department charged with enforcing the uh, the law, so in this case, the Department of Ed, engages in negotiations, if you will, with uh, representatives from the field. So I know that uh, the Instructional Technology Council was at the table. Um, I know that WCET was at the table, and, and other probably other distance ed organizations were at the table discussing with the Department of Ed. Gee, if if we're going to if this is going to become a reality, what does it really mean? Uh, so what we uh, what we have is a pro is 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 a set of requirements that has already. Um, been shaped by input from the field or by representatives of the field. Uh, what what we have from the law is is this paragraph here. Uh, the Higher Education Opportunity Act requires accreditors to require us in the institutions. It doesn't require us to do anything, but it, requ it requires accreditors to do to require something of us, and that is that we have processes in place through which. We establish that that the student who registers in a DE course or program, either or or both, is the same student who participates in the class, so the person who is actually in our class, and completes the program and receives the academic credit. So I've added emphases to all those various components because it's not just a matter of, gee, is that student who's in my class today the student who he or she claims to be, but rather the question is a programmatic one over time. So again, going back to the uh, idea of needing to involve a variety of offices or processes at your institution in answering that question. So over time, uh, over the past couple of years, a lot of there's been a lot of talk about how we should address this, and uh, uh, there are a lot of different ways in which institutions are addressing this, and I've. I uh, collected a number of those here. I'll just run through those real fast. I think the most common one, I, I, certainly within California community colleges, the most common approach to this is to require all of your online classes to use the college learning management system or course so that the institution is then uh, authenticating the student through a central, unique uh, username and unique password that the over which the institution has control or which the institution uh, ensures is, is authentic. Um, um, another way to, to approach this is to require that all DE classes have at least one proctored assessment. One, one high stakes, for, for one, at least one high stakes assessment, uh, students have to come to campus or come to some sort of proctoring uh, center, show a, a valid ID, form of ID, and uh, take their exam there. Uh, so, in, in, in a way in which uh, somebody has, in, in, in some uh, some form of authority, has has validated that or verified that the student taking the assessment is indeed the student uh, whose picture is on the on the driver's license and so on. Um, another uh, way in which this has, uh, which institutions have addressed this, is to uh, be a little bit more upfront about informing students. Um, of what students are doing when they log in, uh, the, the legal obligations of students to, to 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 be honest about their identity. So I'll let you read that that little paragraph under pay, under item three. So that that's 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 an example of language that we've used here at College of the Canyons. We put that on our Blackboard splash page. So just one more little reminder to students: Hey. Uh, you really better be sure that you're who you say you are. James, uh, yes. James, I'm going to interrupt just a second because the additional piece to that is that we're trying, that we're doing in training for our faculty is asking them within their courses to have a conversation in their discussion forums about just this, so they understand that 
um, they could be uh, committing a crime by by being having someone else do work for them, especially if they're uh, receiving financial aid. So we're asking our faculty to have that conversation and to talk to them about why they need to be who they are, what is, what's important to us about them being in integrity in their courses. I just wanted to throw that little piece in there. Absolutely, absolutely, Pat. I think that's essential in faculty training, and I know how much faculty training you do and a lot of us do throughout the state, and that's absolutely essential to uh, have that conversation with your faculty, to have professional development uh, activities with your faculty in which you're asking them, gee, how do, you, how do you address academic integrity? Do you have a conversation with your students? Uh, it's not all about the gotcha. Uh, approach uh, certainly that that is one component. The, the 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 cop approach is one component to this, but also the the educational approach is 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 very important and I think very widespread. And that is let's educate our students about ethics, about academic integrity, make that an explicit part of what we do in the classroom. Absolutely, positively, uh, and certainly a uh, number of folks around the country. I don't not sure whether we do the we haven't I haven't seen California community colleges. But a number of folks around the country, institutions around the country, are utilizing um, uh, other other kinds of other kinds of technology, uh, the retinal scan, the camera panning the room, uh, and so on and so forth. I think most of us have sort of a low threshold or low cost uh, uh, plagiarism detection software, Turnitin.com, or something that that we utilize. Uh, there certainly are an increasing number of vendors out there uh, who are happy to sell us very expensive. Uh, very expensive uh, tools with which we can uh, proctor our students taking the exams at home, in which we can uh, verify their identity. We can do keystroke analysis and a whole host of whole host of other other types of uh, sort of, of identity verification. I see there are quite a few questions in the chat window there, uh, and one I think be out there if you need. Yeah, could you? Uh, I think one yeah. one had to do with uh, with the fact of gee, if you if you require your students to come come to campus for or come to a proctoring center for a proctoring exam, what does that do to the whole idea of yeah. a fully online class? And I I certainly uh, have have a lot of lot of uh, empathy with, with that with that standpoint. Um, uh, that's why the I believe that we have some flexibility in um, in the way in which we approach this uh, these regulations. Uh, one way could certainly be to require everybody to use your uh, college LMS. Uh, the proctoring is not the required way to approach it. It's one of the options, I believe, and, uh, and Jack will talk more about specifically what the uh, commission is, is expecting. But uh, proctoring is not the, not the sole required way to approach it. It's one way in which you can approach it. Then a uh, second question would be, uh, I, I guess it would be related, is uh, with virtual proctoring, where they have to validate their ID, would would that suffice under number two? So the I, the language that I've seen would suggest yes uh, that uh, virtual proctoring, uh, which you might have a camera uh, panning a student's uh, test environment, uh, or you might have uh, a keystroke analysis going on while the student's taking taking the exam, or you might have a series of of uh, personal questions uh, popping up on the screen every ten questions or so on. Uh, yeah, those those kinds of those kinds of uh, evolving technical uh, technical solutions, I, I believe, are uh, accounted for in the in the regulations. And uh, what I think, I, I, I hate to say anything positive about this this requirement, but uh, I think one of the one of the few positive things about this requirement is is that uh, there is a menu, or we're provided with a menu of options, and, and the commission has. As I think uh, we'll see in a second when Jack uh, gives us his, his perspective, I think the commission has given us a, a menu of options uh, that that um, permit institutions to uh, promote academic integrity according to their local cultures and uh, their local budgets as well. So with that, I'm going to uh, move on to uh, to Jack Pan from. Uh, from the commission, vice president at the commission, and uh, we will find out what the real answer is, Jack. Thank you, James, for the uh, nice introduction. Um, I, I'll, uh, what I have to say will be as engaging and informative as, uh, as what you've just provided for us. Well, thank. You. I don't want to give away the answers. You've got the answers. Oh no, 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 no. The answers come from the colleges. That's, I know, I know, and I appreciate that. 
Um, you know, this uh, the first slide. We we don't have to go through it because it just repeats the federal regulation about uh, student um, identity. But you know, this all came uh, home to ACCJC a while back when it was brought to the uh, commission's attention um, about a, a student who applied uh, uh, to transfer credits in to a college uh, for a bachelor's science nursing program. And uh, that student's transcripts included one semester in which uh, the student uh, demonstrated that uh, he or she had taken 103 credits from seven institutions in, in one semester. And that was uh, sort of the startling revelation that, uh, yes, this is really coming home to roost, that uh, there's uh, the just the general nature of delivery of distance education seems to invite fraud. And uh, your cartoon about the dogs, you know, up, up here in Northern California, there's even a country song about uh, about how we're all different when we go online. So, um, but additionally, and the next slide demonstrates uh, that not only is it the um, institution has to verify student identity, identity, but uh, institutions have to ensure that they have policies uh, in place to protect student identity. And if there are any charges uh, or fees associated uh, with that verification process, that those need to be communicated to the student up front. Um, there was a case of an institution uh, at which the records of thousands of students, faculty, staff, um, and others were hacked through a computer used to control the parking uh, access on campus. And um, so all the personal information that, that was connected to those students uh, was uh, hacked. And uh, so the institution really needs to take, institutions really need to take care in ensuring one, that they verify the identity, and two, that they take efforts to protect the identities of students once they've gathered all this um, verification documentation. So the, 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 the next slide uh, talks about the uh, different ways that have, and you've covered them already, James, some of them. But the secure login and password for now is certainly a method that uh, can be used to ensure uh, student identity, probably uh, at one point that was thought to be the be all end all, but maybe not so much anymore. Proctored examinations have been uh, discussed, and, and I have something further to say about that later on. There are other new technologies and, and practices that have been developed that are very effective, such as the um, turn it in uh, uh, plagiarism programs, the uh, uh, folks that are in the uh, composition. Uh, department on any campus probably are familiar with programs that check uh, for plagiarism. And some of those can be employed in the identity of student uh, uh, verification. Uh, and one effective one is the regular monitoring of the engagement between students and faculty members. Just like in face-to-face -face online, instructors can tell uh, something about the personality of a student by the way he or she responds, either in written work or uh, or otherwise, uh, to postings, to class assignments, and uh, instructors can get a feel for what their students are like. In fact, that can be built into the course through a series of introductory uh, activities, and where the instructor gets a feel at the beginning for what this uh, person is like at the other end of the um, computer screen. And then monitor that when, when a person's personality in, in this venue suddenly changes, that's a good indication that there might be somebody else sitting at the desk taking the test or doing the papers. Um, and the next slide talks about uh, the uh, learning management systems that uh, institutions use. Um, that are uh, able to track the kind of engagement that I just mentioned between students and faculty. 
and to ensure that those are regular and substantial. And if they are regular and substantial, then I think that will allow faculty members to, um, to have a sense of the uh, identity of their students. Um, some uh, systems uh, have um, been developed that allow colleges to verify regular attendance, and those uh, can be used. Um, and then the ones that I mentioned that English faculty should know about is uh, monitoring the syntax and whatnot of the written work submitted by students. When institutions uh, look to have proctored tests, say, done at libraries, in communities where students are taking classes or at uh, another institution or something, they need to exercise some care in the selection of those sites um, because um, you want to make sure that those sites uh, can be counted on. Um, also, um, careful thought should be done into, into giving of written assignments. Uh, so a faculty member should not use the same assignment semester after semester, but vary the assignments. Similarly, with tests, questions should not be given semester after semester in the same, in the same order. Uh, or even the same exact question. Uh, so there are other things that you can do, just as you would in the old days, uh, to you know sort of uh, disguise from your section A composition class when you give them the test from what you give to the section B composition class in its test. So you have these little built-in uh, triggers that enabled you to uh, uh, sort of keep tabs on the student's tendency to want to share information. Um, so you know, I think there's a lot of things that institutions can do. And uh, uh, later on, we'll talk about what the uh, uh, commission looks for when it sends teams out to, um, uh, to, to determine the quality of the distance education programs and services. So Jack, basically it sounds like what you guys are looking for is for us to have a clear set of policies about this. Absolutely. That, okay. So and these are some of the suggestions with um, a couple of them, as James has pointed out, are you have to pick one of those that he's pointed out. And then as long as we have a clear process in place, that's really what you're going to be looking for. Yes. And, and Jack, this is James again. And, and, and I'm all, it also sounds as though uh, a, a helpful component or, or a component at least that you're encouraging is to have a to 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 have an institutional culture that promotes academic integrity in which uh, in which faculty maybe are not not being policed in in terms of what what kinds of exams they're offering or, or, or use like using but in which the part of the part of the conversation about quality teaching is gee should I be using the same exam over and over again uh, gee should I be uh, having a conversation about academic integrity with my students that, that kind of that kind of institutional culture uh, absolutely, James. The, um, uh, the issue of academic integrity isn't unique to, uh, to distance education. It's institutional integrity overall. It just, takes, it just wears a different mask or takes on a different persona when you talk about distance ed. And there are a few extra steps that need to be taken to ensure that institutional integrity is um, maintained in that venue. And, and let, let me let me ask you a question, Jack. That, that I, I, we've talked about before, uh, and that is, uh, as this develops, you might have we we oftentimes we oftentimes have faculty members who say, "Gosh, my publisher provided material uh, lets me do something that I can't do in my school's Blackboard, for example." Um, can and, and that faculty member will say, "Gee, I want." I'll let my students log into Blackboard, but then they're immediately going to click on a link and log out to that publisher material. Any thoughts on that? So I think Krista's going to answer this one. Krista John's in our office. Go ahead, Krista. Well, you know, there we are going to have, and the next section is going to talk about attendance and and tracking students who are active in the distance education environment. But uh, these are excellent questions for a distance education coordinator to engage in with faculty and staff uh, while they're determining you know, what, what they'll do for orienting faculty or for orienting students to the online environment. I, there are lots of what ifs, and it seems that regulators are always trying to keep one step ahead 
but at most maybe sometimes they're keeping even with uh, the tricks that some that folks will try as they as they are uh, tempted in the online environment. Mm -hmm. I think there's also another thing that, that the folks out here need to know, and that is that the ACCJC is actively working on educating its, the people on their teams to what to look for and how to work with you on um, what it is you should have in place. And as that, is, that process is completed, I know that James and I are both involved in that with Jerry and a couple of other people. As that um, becomes a little more solid, we'll get that information out to you so that we can be a little clearer about it. Um, there's also issues about the, um, the publishers that we really need to address in another venue. That's a huge topic that I think we do need to talk about, but probably not in this particular venue. And, and I think you said earlier that uh, the important thing is for institutions to have um, policies and practices in place to right. ensure uh, the verification of student identity, but also, as you might guess from accreditation standards, that uh, those policies and practices are reviewed periodically uh, for their effectiveness in uh, maintaining uh, integrity at the institutional level. Right. All right. A um, couple questions, Pat, or we have time for questions? Uh, you know, we're we're doing pretty well. I'd like to be done with this next part for when Barbara comes in, um, comes back in. We're doing pretty well on time. You could probably do one or two, Mike. I'd probably do one. Let's do one. If you have any more. Okay. Let's see here. We do, but let me uh, find. Frankie uh, asks, um, can you have individuals of integrity proctor a student to avoid forcing a student? Uh, into your site by vetting the proctor? And if so, is there an ACCJC recommended approach to such a process? Only certain individuals, legal docs signed for integrity of the proctor, et cetera? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, haven't, um, I haven't entertained that one before. The, the standards don't, don't, don't say that. And the uh, uh, distance ed task force that we are calling together for a second meeting uh, later this month, uh, we will uh, discuss that topic. But again, that just goes into the basket of a variety of things that institutions can use. And if they have success, demonstrate success with that uh, method, then uh, that could be another, uh, another piece of fruit in the basket. And, and I think that that's something that many of us do, Frankie, is we do um, allow our students in fully online classes to uh, work with a proctor that's somewhere where they live, and then we vet that proctor. And um, you know, some uh, some of us have have processes about that that we can share with you as well. So um, hopefully, we have time for one more. Um, okay. Hopefully, we can get our emails out to you so that you have that information and can get back to us. Go ahead. So, so Jim J uh, from Air Coast asks, uh, from an accreditor's perspective, when is policy required, and when is a clear set of recommended practices sufficient? Uh, I think it depends on what the. Okay. I'm, I'm going to take a stab at that. This is Susan Clifford. Mm -hmm. um, I think it depends on what the college is able to reinforce and uh, uphold. I mean, is, is recommended practices something that the college can follow up on and evaluate and see if it's working, or is it a policy? So that's an it depends question answer on whether it you know is it a, is your policy what you need in order to get people to do what they have to do? That's, yeah, right. that's the answer to the question. So next one question, as a matter of fact. Okay, can we go on and we'll try to come back. Hopefully, we'll have some more time. Um, and Mike, if you could push them for me too, that'd be great. I'm getting lazy in my old age. <laughs> okay, last date of attendance. Um, that's what I'm going to be speaking to you about, and that's something that does relate to uh, financial aid. And uh, funny little, there's my it's depend comment that I thought you guys might enjoy. This little cartoon that says it depends. Um, actually, I thought Cheryl and Pam would enjoy that one too. So, Mike, if you can go on. Um, Last date of attendance is the date the institution um, is expected to use to calculate the amount of Title IV refund. Now, Title IV is the financial aid, federal financial aid. And so uh, 
the later the LDA, the later the last date of attendance, the less refund um, that is uh, required by the feds for the financial aid money. So if a student drops a course, for example, midway through, they've got to pay back that money. If we can't provide them with the information about when the student's last date of attendance was, then we're liable for that uh, for that refund. You can go on. Um, and recently, without the issuance of regulations or formal guidance, the Department of Education has taken the position that documenting the student's LDA um, is an academic, academically related activity. And it requires more than just attendance in the student's electronic classroom. Now, the implications for that um, is that, I'm going to go on. Uh, I'll, I'll continue. Okay. Under both the current and proposed Department of Ed rules, if an institution is not required and does not voluntarily take attendance, the institution may either use the midpoint of the financial aid payment period as the effective withdrawal date, or it may document the student's actual last date of att attendance as determined by his or her last known academically related activity. And what, what that should trigger for you is if you have to pay back money, you want to be as clear as you can be and have it documented when the last date was that that student attended. Because that's going to be less money if that has to happen. And I, I think that some of our um, ACCJC folks can tell some stories about that a little bit later. I don't have any personal stories about it, thank you. I think we did have to pay back some money once, about 20000 that we had to pay back. And some of you have um, more horror stories about that than I do. Uh, this is the implications for us. Is traditionally, we calculate that uh, LD on the last day a student entered the secure classroom site. That could be off of the data that we receive in our stats from our course management system. And um, that's a little spooky because we've been using that, and honestly, that is not going to work anymore. And that's what this uh, new regulation says, is that we can't just use that before. Uh, anymore. We, we could use it before, but not now. So, and that's back to they're looking retroactively, and I don't know how far back they're going, but they could look retroactively at that. Um, and you know why, because if a student is just checking into their course management system, it doesn't say that they're doing anything. And so the Department of Ed has taken a position that documenting the student's last date of attendance um, is an academic, academic related activity, and it requires more than that. So what does it require? Okay. Um, academic engagement for online enrollments. And that, um, academic engagement, some of us know as regular effective contact. Some of us know that as substantive contact. Um, it's contact in, with the course, and it's engaging in the activities of the course. So that's a little bit different than just attending. Right, so think about that for just a second. In a face-to-face -face class, you have a student coming into your class, and that student coming in, um, even though may not be turning in any work or may not be engaging in the activities of the class, unless they've got their head down on the desk down to sleep, they're hopefully picking up something. And they're putting that effort forward, and you know they're there. If you're just looking at stats in an online class, you don't know that they're doing anything else. They could just log in and then you know, go watch TV or you know, go to a baseball game or whatever and come back and you don't know. So there's the difference in that particular thing. Okay. So I think I've mentioned this before. Um, this is where they're talking about regular and substantive interaction in the same breath as saying engagement. And I think that the word that we can use is engagement. All right. And they're saying through discussion board posts, completed assignments, or electronic conversations with faculty. And um, there's, we probably have some other definitions that would work for that as well. Outcomes. OK, you guys should laugh at that. Um, the Department of Ed admits that there is no prior general guidance, guidance supporting this position, but it's retroactively applied this to the prior year's program practices. The ultimate bad outcome is an audit finds that your program lacks sufficient engagement and should be classified as correspondence, which could make them ineligible to participate in the Title IV program. So I think all of this is tied back to the money. It's tied back to the financial aid piece. You may have to pay money back, or you may become ineligible. Okay, so what are some things we can do? Well, we could make it clear to online teaching faculty that course management or learning management statistics are not enough. Um, 
and we can define what regular effective contact is, define what engagement is, um, and do that as a policy or a practice at your college. We have a regular effective contact policy. And um, James, did you want to talk about that for just a second with what happened to you? See if he'll unmute himself. Yeah, I'll just unmute him. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, we were at College of the Canyons. We were one of the we were one of the fortunate schools to be a test case for the Department of the Department of Education back oh was it 2010 2000, 2010 I think it was yeah with with a with um, a week and a half notice the Department of Ed came and uh, conducted a, t a Title IV or fi federal financial aid audit um, of our campus specifically looking at distance education. The auditors were very professional, very polite, very friendly, very nice, and very open about the fact that they were responding to the Harkin hearings in Congress, uh, which, which, in their words, had um, had um, sort of forced the, forced the department to go after the uh, for profits, the big bad actors in the for profits, but they had to get cover by going after some publics, and we were one of the lucky publics they chose. Um, we passed with flying colors. So, so everything everything turned out turned out fine, uh, but they were very open also about the fact that uh, they had not informed the field that no that the regulations would not go into effect until July of the following year, and they were here in in September of you know the preceding year. Uh, but nevertheless, they were here, so it was it was difficult to argue with them. Um, again, they were very nice. We passed with flying colors, but it took a lot of work on behalf of a lot of people in the, throughout the institution. And we had, and we also had. You also had a policy in place, and we do too. And I think that that's really an important piece as well. I think I think put that in the resources for you too. Um, we've talked about that. I said we have to have a policy for engagement, or what that is. So that policy has to be created and enforced. Um, instructors need to save the work of the student who's been dropped. If you've dropped somebody, save the work or document when their activity stops. So you have the documentation. You can. Say this is what happened, and you have the evidence that shows that. Okay. The institutional definition of excessive absences is also something that you might want to have, and this is for your regular program. Um, I asked a lawyer at the ACA conference recently what we could do about getting a, a draw policy that would work for our online courses, and her her suggestion was to define excessive absences as an institution uh, for on ground classes, and then translate that into online. How would we use that for online? So maybe the first place to start as far as when you're going to, are you going to drop students and when are you going to do that and how are you going to do that, having a drop policy would be to sh be sure that your institution has defined excessive absences. And you know, at our college we really, we have something that we all pretty much use, but I think we need to be really clear that it should be the same for everyone. Um, and some samples, and you may have some samples in this word comments. Um, if you have samples, if you could put your name up there in the um, chat window and we can contact you at your college about those samples, we might be able to collect some of those. Ours is right now when a student has not participated in discussions or other forms of communication and, ha and or has not submitted assignments for two consecutive weeks, the instructor will attempt to contact the student and notify them they have five days to complete. Or, or be dropped from the class, then the instructor will also document the student's work until the point of dropping the student. Now this is new for us that we've put that in there and um, a little scary, we've had some real incidents in the last few weeks where we've had people really upset about we've dropped them from their course, but, but the instructors, bless their hearts, had what we asked them to do in their syllabi, a note that said it, exactly this, if you don't engage, and here are the ways that you engage. If you don't do this for two weeks, I will drop you from the class. And because the instructors had that in their syllabi, it was really easy to take that back to the student and say, look, it says it right here. One of our students said, oh, he just changed his syllabi. But we have the copies from the beginning of the semester on file, and we were able to pull that out and say, no, it's been that way. So you know, sorry, you weren't doing the work, and we have the documentation to show that. And he said, I've been checking into the class. And we said, yeah, that's not enough. You've got to engage in the activities. You've got to submit the assignments. So I think that's the end of mine. Um, if you have those samples, if you can post your name and college in there, we can find you. And Jack, I think you're going to comment a little bit on this topic as well, correct? Oh, 
yeah, uh, actually as part of the section on evaluating, oh no, I guess that's next. All right, sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm back on. Did, did you have any comments about the last date of attendance? Uh, no, not specifically. Okay. But I think it's good when you put it, when you make such a policy institution wide and that you uh, put it in the um, syllabi for all the courses. I mean, that's a contract between the student and the instructor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so when it comes to evaluating distance education um, as part of a comprehensive or other kind of uh, visit to an institution, there are several things that the uh, commission will expect uh, colleges to uh, have, have a handle on. And one of them is, does the institution know where its DE students are located? Uh, and then that will enable it to identify the states with which it needs to seek uh, state authorization. So the first thing is, do you know where your DE students come from? Um, that there are, uh, accreditation expects that institutions have policies that define regular and substantive interaction or contact between the faculty and the uh, instructor for DE courses and uh, we'll look to see that those policies are in place and that they are uh, being used. Um, teams will look at what kinds of special training that um, are, are provided uh, for faculty who wish to move into the uh, online environment or when faculty are hired to teach an online course, what kinds of special qualifications that exist for those kinds of faculty. Um, the next uh, slide continues this thought a bit. Uh, it, it, it says that, um, that the college should also have in place processes by which it prepares the students uh, for to be successful in distance education courses and monitors their success uh, throughout the semester. Um, uh, some colleges I have heard have uh, a, an orientation for online students that must be completed before students can enroll. And it talks about readiness for online education, student responsibilities, and uh, lays all this uh, up front and uh, requires that all students that take online courses complete this uh, mini orientation first. Um, the, the colleges should ensure that they are gathering uh, evidence about their distance ed students, um, the student use of uh, support services, counseling, advising, uh, also um, learning support, tutoring, labs, library, etc. Um, they should uh, gather information that uh, would verify that the students are go undergoing, uh, to what degree they are undergoing identity validation. Um, and then to have uh, policies on regular and effective contact between the as in faculty member and the student. And the final slide in this uh, section says that um, colleges must must ensure that there are policies that dictate satisfactory pro uh, progress in a distance ed course, and this would include the. Uh, last day of attendance. There should be policies on how uh, institutions expect uh, online instructors to report this information. Um, also that the institution assures that its online learning and support services for uh, distance ed students are comparable to those that are offered face-to-face -face, uh, students. The, the issue of comparability of uh, quality um, of programs and services to students is an issue that the commission is concerned about. Um, just because it's offered online doesn't mean that it is any less of any less quality or that it is supported by any less uh, services to students. It doesn't have to be identical uh, services, but comparable services. And then we always tell teams uh, in our trainings and institutions that are undergoing self-evaluation uh, trainings 
that they need to analyze data for their uh, distance ed or online students and compare it to the face-to-face -face students. So if you have a composition class, for example, and you have 10 sections that meet face-to-face -face and then the equivalent of two sections that meet uh, in an online format, how are those online uh, students in the online delivery uh, of that course doing in comparison to the face-to-face -face students? And um, if that is identified as a gap in, in expectations, so if the face-to-face -face students are continually doing better, achieving more, learning more uh, than the distance ed students, then what um, in our process of program review and analysis of student achievement and learning information, then what steps will the institution take to increase the success and the learning of students that are involved in the online courses? And then um, are sufficient uh, college resources available and are they being used and are they being planned for sustainability? for uh, human resources, technology resources, facilities and financial resources used in support of distance education programs and services. Any comments? Yes, Question for you, Jack. Uh, sure. Uh, James uh, says, in a time of budget cuts, to what extent can an institution say it no longer provides a certain support service for online students due to a lack of funding? <laughs> Um, I would I suppose I would have the same reaction as if they said uh, for the students that are taking the, the courses face to face in our satellite campus in the valley or out at the seashore or up in the mountains, they're no longer going to have access to uh, our um, our uh, tenured faculty. That uh, they'll all be second string faculty, uh, ones that couldn't get tenure, and we're shifting all the old. Uh, laptop computers and all the old uh, textbooks as we weed them out of our life, we're shifting them all over to our off-campus site. It wouldn't be acceptable. Mm -hmm. you, and, a, and an institution wouldn't advertise, come to our main campus and get a high-quality education with top-notch faculty and great facilities and technology to, uh, to enable you to be successful. Uh, but take our online courses or our courses offered at our satellite centers, and we can't guarantee the quality. Thanks, Rick. Okay. Um, one, one other question for you real quickly here is, uh, will everything in the guide to evaluating DE and CE be in the self-study guidelines that colleges have to write to? Uh, those are separate. Uh, the the, the self-study manual is a manual for the uh, two years of preparation and the writing of the self evaluation report. The guide, and it, and it encourages it to be used in conjunction with the guide to evaluating institutions and the guide to evaluating distance ed and correspondence education. So those three manuals are taken together. And the two guides, as you know, break up the standards by standard and subsection of each standard and then ask questions that um, colleges should use to um, to ensure that they meet the standards, um, and teams are, are using those same two manuals and the same list of questions uh, to determine if an institution meets the standards. And at the end of each of those standard sections is a list of uh, possible evidence that an institution can, can offer up uh, to uh, verify its, its claims that it meets the standards. So I don't see those things merging together. I see them as a as the two guides being used by both teams and by colleges undergoing training. Uh, uh, that's, that's probably correct. I think what we did was we looked at them both and we took those questions and put them into the standards as we wrote. Okay. Yes. yes. And it worked pretty well. Uh, Martha has a really good question. If the majority of our students enrolled in DE courses reside in the area and take on campus classes, does the institution need to provide com co compar comparable services at a distance? And I think that I think that the question there she's saying is the majority of their students are in the area. Um, everything. Yeah. The answer, the answer is no. Uh, yes, they do need to provide services for students in the distance. When you enroll a student, you promise them access to the entire set of support services the institution offers. Yeah. Pretty clear. Yes. Okay, um, we have to move on. We've we're, we've got about 20 minutes left, so and we've got a bit to cover. So um, I'm going to turn this over to Barbara, who's back, 
and uh, Krista for the $42 million question. Krista, take it away. Okay, well, thanks everybody again for this program. We think the $42 million question is one you're going to be interested in, and you may not have thought about it, and it's whether your program is distance education or correspondence education. You know, most of us have a concept of correspondence that's rooted in the old paper and postal service model from years ago. These days, the distinction isn't so much about the means of distribu distribution as it is the manner in which the instruction is happening. And this particular case study, and it's a real one, a recent one, will show how close that line can be, and it raises some real issues for practice in distance education programs. Um, so, you know, the, the regulations define what is distance ed and is also what is correspondence ed. If you look at the bottom of this slide, you see a reference, 34 CFR 602.3. 34 CFR is the code of federal regulations that pertain to education. And if you can find that when you go online, if you do a little search for ECFR. And I do suggest that if you do this often, you're going to want to look at this uh, and, and bookmark it. And the 600s are for higher education. The 602s are for accreditors and what they need to have in their standards and what they need to monitor and track in member institutions. But if you look at this definition, you're looking at instruction delivered to students who are apart from the instructor. There is regular and substantive interaction between the students and the instructor. And you're looking at a variety of technologies for delivering that it, uh, education. Going on now to the definition of correspondence education, you see some similarities. You see that the materials can be provided from, by mail, but also through many of the electronic transmissions. Uh, but you'll see that there's limited interaction between students and instructors. And that interaction is primarily uh, initiated by the students. So that takes us to this particular um, this case, the St. Mary of the Woods audit. And here's an instance where a college's financial aid audit hits the news. Some of you may actually have seen this reported in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, there were other items that were part of the audit. I want to mention that. But we're going to deal with the main issues which were about characterization of the courses as either distance education or correspondence education. And just, uh, just so you see on the slide, there were undergraduate courses and graduate teacher licensure courses that were marketed under something called the Woods External Degree Program. They called it WED. And uh, the courses were offered on the learning management system. There were specific faculty assigned to teach the courses. They were scheduled for a full semester. Uh, there was the option for an extension if the work was incomplete. Uh, I'm just setting this up so you see that they were not such an unusual place for our future punchline. Uh, and here's something, though, that about two-thirds of the college's students were taking some or all of their courses on this program, on this online program. So. Those unfamiliar with financial aid processes might believe the U.S. Department of Education audits financial aid primarily by looking at the financial aid office and how they qualify students for financial aid and for distributing funds. Um, but here's an example where the main issue was in instruction. Look at what the auditors reviewed. They looked at program descriptions on the college website. They looked at materials in the catalog and on brochures. They interviewed students and faculty and administrators. They, they picked syllabi, not randomly. They had them spread across the disciplines. And they picked ones where, in these online courses, there was large enrollment. And then they went on to the learning management system. And they looked at the content. And they also looked at the tracking records 
of student and instructor activity. One more, one more. Okay, looking at the elements considered. This is how the auditors looked at deciding whether classes were distance ed or correspondence ed. Look at this. The system had features for participating in discussion boards, chat rooms, viewing videos. They weren't required, though. Uh, grading was based on submission of assignments and tests, not on that online communication. Let's think about courses at the colleges, perhaps at your colleges. You know, we do feel that there may be faculty members who are not fully using all of the features of the learning management system. Well, okay, here we have instructors who uh, graded assignments and returned them online. They were available to answer questions. They periodically sent boilerplate kinds of messages to the students, but they didn't deliver a lecture or initiate discussion with students. And students decided whether they participated in tutoring or other instructional resources. Um, so if you're looking here, one thing that should strike you is it isn't that there was no faculty interaction with students. Faculty did respond to student questions and did follow up with students who seemed not to be doing their required work. But the auditors found that level of interaction to not be sufficient in meeting the definition of distance ed. They looked at the syllabi. And they noticed that the syllabi described the reading and assignments and offered suggested schedules. But the syllabi did not describe mandatory or regular and substantive interaction between student and instructor. And more or less, the student posts and discussion forms were student driven. The grades were not affected if students did or did not use the features. So, you know, thinking again about courses that we have, you know, are there online faculty who don't really change their syllabi between on site and online courses? Um, there are syllabi in the on site classes, face to face, that generally set out, a, you know, kind of general expectations, and they're not particularly directive. They are primarily looking at written work and at uh, doing tests. Well, that may be an issue moving that, that same syllabus to the DE environment. What were the auditor's conclusions? They concluded that the entire college was not eligible for federal financial aid because 50% or more of its students were enrolled in correspondence courses. Those courses did not meet the definition of distance ed. And they recommended that the Secretary of Education require a full refund to the feds of more than $42 million. And so think about it. Because the college's online program didn't meet this definition of distance ed, all of the financial aid for that college was placed at risk. So what are some of our implications? You know, we tend to rely upon instructional guidelines, policies, and procedures. But you know, here the auditors were looking at actual practice, not just what was in college documents. The effective practice really has to be at the course level. If the auditors will look at syllabi, student and faculty interviews, and usage patterns, it's not going to be just a document review. And you know, here, that little bullet point, the second one, it should kind of raise alarms for, for courses where the discipline faculty may be used to having the work primarily, the grade primarily based upon written work or on tests. Because courses which largely, largely consist of written work, completed and submitted by students and graded by instructors, are going to fit the definition of correspondence education rather than distance education. And let's take it up another level. Let's look at online aided on-site courses. We're, get, we're talking about courses where some portion of the instructional time for a class in the course outline of record is put online. If you look at item two bolded, if a course is part correspondence and part residential, 
that means face to face, the Secretary of Education will consider that entire course to be correspondence education. And so instructors really need to know those online elements have to demonstrate instructional activities. It can't just be, well, for that part of the class that they were not in coming together, you're supposed to go online and, and download the reading and upload your homework or do the test. So you know, we, have, we have some advice. The advice is that if instructional hours of the course are allocated for online work, colleges should ensure the online work has documented and demonstrated elements of instruction. It's not just for filling homework uh, assignments out or taking tests. In, in other words, you're trying to avoid the electronic version of paperwork. And you know, questions come up about hybrid courses. This isn't a term used in USDE regulations. Since courses which are distance ed are qualified for financial aid, like on-site courses are qualified, part BE, part face-to-face -face is not an issue in that regard. Um, we do know, Jack mentioned, that uh, distance education courses really need to have comparable services available for those students. But what we are suggesting is that Colleges be concerned with that distinction between substantive interaction with the instructor and merely putting the paperwork part online. Really, the key is regular and substantive interaction between student and teacher. It has to be required in the course. That interaction has to be initiated by the instructor. Um, it's you know, it's central in deciding whether something actually is distance ed instead of correspondence ed. It's needed in every course that's fully online. It's needed in the online parts of classes that are otherwise face-to-face. -face. And it has to be demonstrable and documented. Um, you know, college documents, including the syllabi and the learning management system tracking systems, need to be able to show and save that interaction. It's vital to a college's relationship with the feds for student financial aid eligibility. And of course, it's key to quality education and student outcomes that are required in the accreditation standards. And we really, this is something that an entire commitment from faculty teaching online uh, is, is needed for. One final note about the role of a creditor. Um, this college, St. Mary of the Woods, was accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. And the commission had recently gone in and completed a substantive change review for the college. They had changed the program in question from correspondence to distance ed based on a plan the college had put together that said they were going to be more DE uh, in the, the next semester. Well, the auditors found this did not absolve the previous activity of the college, as Pat James has warned about in her presentation. And it says the accreditor didn't re-examine the program as it was offered in the past. But moreover, the, the accreditor's determination that the program was no longer a correspondence course was not binding on the US Department of Education. What that means is accreditors really have to take steps to apply the USDE interpretation and rigor in their reviews of member institutions. And uh, even so, notice that working to correct the situation through a substantive change did not absolve the responsibility for past actions. So we have really a triad of accountability between USDE, the state regulators, and the accreditation agencies. But on top of that, we have to remember our primary accountability is to the students being served. And in understanding and implementing these regulations, we all need to keep in mind ways in which student needs can be more effectively met through the impetus of these external entities. Just to show you, we do have some regulations on, on here that when you get the transcript of the presentation, you will see um, 
that these are accessible to you. Barbara, what do you have anything that you would like to add to to this particular case study? I uh, know Chrissy you did a great job, um, but there is a question on the um, on the board, and I'll ask that you upload your URL, which has information about the St. Mary's case, um, to the um, to the session here because folks have been asking about it in the text questions. I will do that. Thank you. Micah, did you see other questions that need to be answered? Or Barbara, did you want to continue? Sure. Um, so we're just in these next couple slides have laid out some of the regulations for you. And in a sense, we've already discussed several of them. Um, but we've also put the citations should you wish to go look at these yourselves. Uh, as Krista mentioned, the 602 series are uh, regulations that pertain to accreditors. So if you want to see what we are supposed to ensure or examine, you can go to the 602 session. And the first is the verification or the authentication of student identity. The second on this page is that uh, the quality of distance ed has to be equipped. Uh, the quality of face-to-face -face education, but it also has to meet quality standards, meaning accreditation standards. And um, the third is that institutions have to establish and maintain records to document their fulfillment of college and program eligibility under Title IV. And this is where some of your requirements as institutions to carefully uh, label correspondence and distance education classes and make sure those uh, attributions are accurate uh, uh, is emphasized. And in the next slide, a few more of the um, regulations. Um, this is the regulation regarding eligibility to offer federal financial aid. Um, if more than 50% of courses are correspondence education, or then more than 50% of the regularly enrolled students our distance education, um, our correspondence education students, the institution may not be eligible for federal financial aid. And then the last reference to distance education again. So I think that ends our slides. Okay, and I just pushed a, a document that, to all of you that has a lot of uh, resources on it. It doesn't have everything that's in the um, that's in the chat window that we've been putting up. But if you um, you can go to file and save, and you can save the chat conversation if you want to, and it will be saved as a text file. And that will allow you to have all the ones that are in the chat window if that's what you'd like to do. Um, but we have just a few minutes for questions. And Micah, have you seen any um, questions that we may have missed? Uh, let's see here. Bonnie asked if the lab class is accessible online and there is very little faculty initiated interaction. Is this correspondence or independent study? <laughs> I think I'd call it correspondence, but I don't know about you, but that's what I'd call it. Uh, I think something that needs to be clarified, and you could help with this, Barbara, is um, it, there's a difference between replacing face-to-face -face time with distance, with work at a distance, and that's what we're talking about. There's a difference between a face-to-face -face class that has activities and stuff posted online, but the students meet their required amount of hours in the classroom, than what we're talking about here. And I think, Barbara, is that true? I mean, that's the clarification. It's true, right? and, I, and I would just tell you all that the Department of Education is frustratingly caught between wanting to focus on ultimately on the learning outcomes and stuck on seat time and credit hour. And, and we, the recent credit hour regulations that the accreditors are also supposed to, to uh, verify that institutions are following it is a great case in point. But, but it's, it's, it's why, by definition in, in federal regulations, distance education that replaces the in-classroom time is, is, um, is subject to so much scrutiny. Because really, for in-class time, they're simply counting seat time. Mm -hmm. For distance ed, they're looking at substantive and regular interaction. <laughs> Big time, which, you know, I just smile about that because what it was probably about eight or nine years ago that I started talking about this as the, the central component of your course. As a faculty member, I kept telling people that's the central component of your course. 
And um, this really has come back to um, be really true in all of our regulatory issues as well, that that really should be the central component. Um, there's a lot of questions about publisher materials, which I think we should probably leave till another time and take up after the um, task force has met and discusses the topic of publisher materials, which I think is a big piece. Um, I, we're about out of time, and I'd really like to thank all of you who hung in there from 221 to 182. Um, but you guys have done a really good job. And there is a survey that Micah would like you to take a look at right there. Um, and Micah's putting it in the chat window, and we'd really like you to fill that out to let us know how well we did. I love, I love the fact that you all were here. And Barbara and your crew, just thank you so much um, for all of what you put in, and Cheryl. And we hope that Pam is um, okay. She had an accident today and um, is in the hospital, but said she's all right. That's why she's not with us. But we hope that she's doing well. And I think with that, if there's no other comments, we could sign off. Barbara, did you have a final word? Uh, just a response to a question about the uh, PowerPoints. Actually, somebody asked if we'll post those. And, um, and they asked if some of these bullets are available in other ACCJC documents. And they are, but they're kind of spread around. So this PowerPoint will be your best source. And I'd just like to thank um, uh, at one and Pat and everybody who participated in the, providing this workshop for our members. And uh, I hope uh, it's been helpful to, to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. Did you want to say anything? Yeah, just uh, let everybody know that are registered. Uh, there will be an email coming to you uh, with just a follow-up. Uh, it'll have the survey if you uh, don't have the time to fill it out right now, but it will have a survey link as well as the link back to the page where you registered where there will be a, 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 a downloadable presentation uh, that you saw today, as well as the recorded archive.